Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Dominic sort of did all of the, um, the hard work for me. Um, I wanted to start, though, with a thank you um, to Dominic, uh, also to uh, Steffi as well, but also to Dr. Berta uh, and uh, to Dr. Cullen uh, as well, because you gave hope to that sad little island that I sometimes live on last week when there was this wonderful news that you really believed in paper. Uh, and I'm not just saying this because I've been invited into this forum. Um, I'm sure there's many people here from London. It's a bit of a sad place um, at the moment. Uh, uh, we're seeing a, a talent retreat uh, in the market. Uh, people who once upon a time maybe wanted to cut their teeth as a graphic designer, uh, to be a web designer. Is, is London that attractive now when we don't know where things are going? So when the news broke, uh, that Berta uh, was buying, how many magazines do you have now? 80, 70, something extraordinary, uh, a big number. You'll find out anyway. Um, it was um, incredibly exciting. And my inbox last week was really just filled with so many wonderful letters and people saying, you know, thank God there's been a wave two uh, of a German invasion in the UK. Um, I'm now hoping that other sectors will follow suit, and maybe bit by bit, uh, we can figure a couple of things out. Uh, I thought I would um, start, and um, Steffi said, uh, you know, Tyler, come along. I said, what am I going to talk about? Um, the way sort of Dominic sort of set it up, I sort of feel, because I'm in the world of paper, I'm a bit of your sort of court jester um, here today. Um, but uh, there was sort of a serious side. Steffi said, it's been 10 years uh, of Monocle that you've been delivering and doing the magazine, probably sort of 14 years uh, since we actually started uh, developing it. Um, and really sort of a talk, and I just wanted to go through maybe a bit of, um, probably a bit of a trip down um, memory lane. Um, and it sort of, on the, the board here, it sort of sums up exactly um, what we've sort of been doing for the last decade, and that is trying not to be too distracted being more concerned with where the tons of paper are coming from, are the British presses uh, still going to be putting ink on plates? Uh, and I can tell you uh, that becomes a difficult um, experience in and of itself. Um, I thought very quickly, and I've set myself a challenge uh, to go through 100, just 100 images in 10 minutes. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, I think good businesses need to start with a home. Um, many people and faces I see in the audience have probably paid a visit to Midori House in London. Uh, this is our, our headquarters. And it was a place we said we wanted to have presence, and we wanted to have a wonderful place that people could, could come to, um, but also work um, at the same time. So I was walking by, um, and this is sort of maybe a pre-commentary on where we've sort of arrived with, with Brexit, in fact. This building used to be an adult education center in London. And then, of course, the French banks came to London, and everyone said, you know, well, we probably need a second campus of the Lycée in London. And I was always looking at this building, sort of going, you know, I'd love to sort of put a media company there. Anyway, the French got in front of us and they said, nope, it's going to be another Lycée. But in London, somehow, the neighbors sort of surrounding, you can't sort of see the neighbors, they said, absolutely not. We are not going to have a bunch of screaming French brats. Um, in the morning, at lunchtime, we'd rather have some nice sound media people in there instead. So we beat the French. Um, of course, the French banks are all leaving, um, and, and we got the building. This is um, sort of a point of entrance, how you go into our space, lovely place for lunches. Um, and I guess sort of the, the next slide, that's where, uh, that's my office. I sort of call it my editorial D1, uh, where we do things. But when we thought 10 years ago about how we wanted to go out, how we wanted to cover the world, that was probably a time when so many news organizations were demobilizing. Uh, they were moving out of the business of having bureaus, having boots on the ground. So this is Tokyo. Um, this is our bureau in Singapore. Uh, that's Hong Kong, um, Istanbul, uh, New York. Uh, and we also have Toronto and, and Zurich as well. So, we built up this bureau network, all with an eye of getting the, the first issue of the magazine out on newsstand, and that was uh, a decade ago. Uh, and that was the first cover that we did. And as Dominic said, we sort of come out of this sort of you know, background of doing wallpaper magazine, and we felt that there was 
room to not just sort of talk to a globalized person, but a number of things were happening. Within a European context, we had the rise of low-cost carriers. Uh, at the same time, we just saw that you know, people were really, you know, properly living trans-border lifestyles at the same time. And that's what we wanted to reflect as a magazine. Uh, do it based out of London, uh, but sell one edition for the whole world. So people often say, oh, I sort of picked up your Portuguese edition of the magazine. We don't have a Portuguese edition. Uh, we do one edition uh, for the whole planet, so it is one advertising buy. And you know, probably a lot of people remember what happened sort of with the first sort of digital wave that hit a lot of media companies. There was sort of a step back to sort of try to save money on paper, to move everything to sort of digital photography. And we said, let's try to bring out a magazine which is properly bookish, um, something which had some heft and weight. So that was sort of, you know, very much what we did and, and delivered over time. But I want to just go through a couple of the, the pillars um, that were important to us. And, and one was, of course, looking at um, the world of urbanism and cities and looking at governments and, and benchmarks um, became incredibly important for us. So just showing a series of images um, that define uh, our title and photography being a very big thing. And Dominic, as you were sort of saying, so funny sort of in a digital world to operate the way we do, um, we still try to shoot as many pictures as possible on film uh, when we can. So the people at Fujifilm um, like us enormously. And some people say, well, you know, is that just sort of being Luddite? Are you still shooting on film? Um, because, yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice sort of thing to talk to your advertisers about, to, to tell your readers. Uh, we still believe we get better quality um, if we're shooting on large format, if we send someone out in the field to shoot on 35 millimeter, we still believe that, that we get uh, a better quality on page. Um, small business entrepreneurs have also become a very big part uh, of what we do. And we didn't want to just, you know, so when we talk about startup technology, um, I think a lot of what we, we aim to focus on, um, you know, tech is one part of it, but we're also interested in finding the person in Slovenia who is reinventing their grocery store business. We want to go and find that person who might have completely rethought uh, how they want to run a bookstore in Mexico and look at the challenges of those markets. So we've been a little bit sort of deliberate because our friends at, at Wired uh, and our friends at the New York Times and so many people do tech and digital very well and we wanted to be a step back from that. And what was interesting, when we launched in 2007, of course, not a great time to launch a magazine. Um, everything went completely to shit, uh, of course, about nine months to, to 12 months later. Um, but what was interesting, that was the period when we actually saw the magazine start to grow. And part of it was because so many people working for a variety of US banks, Deutsche Bank, and many others had lost their job. And that was really when our, our title started to take off because I think people were looking for something, sort of entertaining their dreams. And we wanted to deliver stories in a very visual manner but I always say, you know, people don't dream in, in spreadsheets. Uh, you're not sort of dreaming in, in PowerPoint, well, hopefully not, in terms of how you'd want to develop your business. You're probably thinking about who is the architect you're going to work with if you want, you know, you've, you've lost your not very exciting job working in a not very nice cubicle at a big US bank, but you got a nice payoff. Uh, but your fantasy, of course, was you wanted to go and launch a gallery. You wanted to go and open a vineyard or do something else. You know, yes, of course, you might have to do a business plan, um, but at the same time, uh, you also wanted uh, to probably think about all of the design components, the talent of the people that you would work with. Um, and that was really, uh, I think, what sort of sent us you know, in a proper growth trajectory um, for our business. Architecture being a, a, very in part of what we, a very important part of what we do. This is an absolutely extraordinary um, place up in the Dolomites. Um, this was the original, uh, corporate retreat um, of, of Ani, of course, of the big uh, Italian energy company. If anyone has a chance um, and has an opportunity, I, a little bit of money, or A, a little bit of money to spend, uh, or to purchase it, uh, or I think to also maybe rethink DLD at a very high level, um, up on the piece, this is an absolutely um, I think sort of magical gem. So um, maybe something else, Mr. Callan, for your shopping list. Um, so
So architecture, I think, is also in design, but also design, how it, I think, permeates businesses um, has been you know, very much a calling card for us. And then also looking at the urban fabric of cities. And you know, oftentimes, we've also tried to sort of walk away from you know, the smart city sort of buzzword, which has become sort of so, yeah, I mean, if I hear about sort of one more person who's developed an app in San Jose, which helps you sort of get around traffic, and we're saying, you need to build good infrastructure first. Uh, you need to be hiring and working with great urban planners and not just trying to find a plaster in terms of how to fix things. So we really try to look at the fundamentals of who are the extraordinary urban planners, the great architects, um, the great landscape designers who can really define our urban environment. Uh, two years ago, we started with our first conference, uh, which was in Lisbon. Last year, we were in Vienna. Uh, and this year, we are going to, to be in Berlin. So, Mark your dates in your diaries. Uh, we'll be exploring everything that makes the urban environment work, everything that tries to really, re really remove as much friction as possible uh, from the urban experience um, in late May. Um, we also sort of realized that probably a lot of our audience is also um, a little bit um, probably over 40 as well. So people like Nana Mascuri are important. Um, and to see how she sort of lives her life, spends her money living on the shores of Lake Geneva. But we, we very, very rarely um, make much of a concession uh, to celebrity. Um, we love going and sort of meeting sort of fantastic um, diplomats and seeing how the Italians spend their money. And we, we, we really had a great, great story um, in it's the current issue on newsstand right now. I don't think anyone in Rome knew the scale of the Italian embassy uh, that they're paying for. Um, it's almost the size of the Imperial Palace, um, but they've been sort of keeping it under wraps from the Italian taxpayer. The likes of Mitsui Fudasan Mori could probably sort of build 70 towers on this thing. Amazing. And this is a place in our graying years, ladies and gentlemen, if we're sort of thinking about a lovely place, a country club that you'd probably like to um, spend a bit of time in. This is um, a shot of two gentlemen, and it's the Italian Foreign Ministries uh, Country Club in Rome, an absolutely amazing place. And these are the types of, of stories that we want to talk about, because it's a great design story. It's a lovely piece about how you can sort of sit among sort of ivy-covered hedges and walls um, and read La Repubblica and have a nap. Um, it's a commentary on where Italy sits in the 21st century, um, the space it occupied in the post-war uh, post years um, as well. So I think we're always trying to take a slightly lateral view, um, slightly sideways, trying to rediscover things that, um, that people forgot about. Um, Swiss people will know what this is. That's at Schwingen. Um, and Schwingen is a, a Swiss form of wrestling where you wear burlap trousers, um, over, well, probably mostly over your existing trousers as well, and then you try to throw someone else in, in sawdust. But it's a great story. You know, we, we devoted 14 pages to it. Um, and then we sort of get then the calls from the Discovery Channel and lots of other people who say, OK, can you introduce us to the right people? We've never sort of heard about it. Um, so this, this idea of also just trying to bring things back to the fore, um, you know, well known to Swiss people, but maybe uh, not so well known um, internationally. Um, at the same time, uh, I think one interesting thing is we sort of realize, of course, we have sort of a large um, male constituency. You can sell a lot of magazines uh, to, well, guys, doesn't matter whether north of 20 or north of 30, by doing a lot of defense uh, and trying to do defense well. So helicopters, submarines, uh, this is that, uh, who knew that Portugal even had, I think it's three submarines. Um, we went on NATO exercises. This is also exciting for journalists as well, uh, that you can send people out onto the high seas, uh, our Japanese uh, helicopter pilot um, in the end. Now we can sort of say, this is sort of a nice, you know, it's the, the equivalent of better versions of cars and things that move quickly. Um, but it also becomes an interesting hook for us as well because it allows us also an interesting um, level of engagement with governments um, and the types of stories that we're, uh, we're able to deliver. Again, I mean, the Italians, you can't beat them, can you? These are the Alpini with their fantastic feathers. Big discussion in Italy right now whether they should be synthetic feathers or real feathers. It being, it being Italy, if they could add fur to it, they would. Um, obviously, uh, fashion, as, uh, as Dominic was saying, um, a very uh, important part of what we do, uh, not just, of course, to service uh, our readership, which is roughly about 70% uh, men, 30% women, um, but obviously 
very important commercially um, as well. But it's kind of interesting to watch. Probably in the early days, we relied probably roughly 80% um, on the likes of uh, major luxury goods companies. It's probably now down to less than 50% now in terms of uh, uh, ad revenue and the types of clients that we would work with. Um, but I guess the last thing which I wanted to jump to um, is, is really our audience and the people that we're out talking to um, month in and month out. And there's often sort of a question saying, what do you do in terms of, of social media? By the way, if you see this gentleman um, right now, um, he is not just recently back uh, from the Middle East. Um, he's a nice Italian boy from Long Island. Danny Giacopelli is somewhere around here. He's one of our correspondents uh, who's doing interviews for DLD. But um, is the idea of actually having great gatherings, lots of people. We do over 80 events a year. So people say, what is your social media strategy? I say it's a fantastic Weisburgunder, uh, hopefully some good canapes. That's our social media strategy. We try to get in front of readers, our audiences, as, as much as possible. Um, and, and doing that quite frequently uh, with a, a number of uh, radio events as well. We're running a 24-hour radio station. And then, oh, by the way, of course, um, mascot is a huge thing. We're sort of, look, this is Monochan. So there's actually, if you're an intern, that's how we start off our interns. They have to go inside of um, the owl. Um, and if they can um, sort of muster that over an event, uh, they get to stick around. I'm just going to leave you finally just with, um, I guess what's been the greatest thing in terms of reaching our audience and talking to people is retail. Um, it's been a fantastic part of our business, something we're really looking to grow, six stores around the world. We've moved into cafes uh, supported by books and many, many other things. Um, but at the same time, we're only going to survive. Berta is only going to survive in the UK market if there's great places to go and purchase titles. Um, and that's what we're doing and delivering. If anyone's looking for a franchise opportunity, this is Kiosk Cafe. It's our new venture in selling the best print and hopefully the best coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs>